Although Coffee Lake and Intel 6-core CPUs have undoubtedly been planned since before Ryzen's launch, it appears that AMD woke the sleeping giant this year after some prods from Ryzen and from Threadripper. Intel's i7-8700K launches today. It's a 6-core, 12-thread part that targets high frequencies, and that launch is accompanied by a target MSRP of $360, about a $10 to $20 price increase over KB Lake. This is the competition part of the market. Intel moved up the X299 launch to compete with Threadripper, but what we'll never know is whether Intel adjusted its target price to compete with Ryzen, at least on the Coffee Lake CPUs. Either way, the i7-8700K is here now, and we've got a densely packed review covering most aspects of the new CPU lineup. This video is brought to you by the Be Quiet Dark Base Pro 900 White Edition. The DBP900 marks a return to full tower cases, equipped with ample hard drive support, effective noise damping foam, high performance fans, and the option to be inverted into an alternative layout. The tinted tempered glass window and Qi charger add a high-end touch to an already well-built case. Learn more at the link in the description below. So lots of things to know for this review. First of all, we got the worst possible 8700K sample that could be made. The overclocking headroom on ours was much worse in terms of voltage versus frequency than what many of our peers got. So while I am envious of the other CPU samples out there, it at least gave us a, an excuse to step through a couple hours worth of trying every trick in the book to get the thing to clock a little bit higher. We ended up stuck at about 4.9 gigahertz, but kind of hit 5.0. And the thing is, I, I've got a screenshot from Der Bauer I can share on the screen. He is giddy at the CPU he got. I mean, Der Bauer, he has a couple of them, and that one in particular does 5.2 gigahertz at something like 1.375 volts or somewhere around there. The guy is lucky. Uh, that's a crazy overclock. Ours shows just how the Silicon Lottery works and why companies and websites like Silicon Lottery are in existence. Our CPU does 4.9 to 5.0 at about 1.4 to 1.42 volts, depending on the test. And at 5.0, we can't pass Blender even with 1.42 volts. So a little disappointed there, but we still did the delating thing, did liquid metal, all that stuff, uh, plenty of stuff to do, still overclocked to 4.9 or 5.0 where it held. And we haven't tried overclocking since applying liquid metal. So there might be more room in there now because we've got more thermal headroom to increase the voltage further. We've reduced power leakage, things like that. Doing everything that we can to push the thing further. And we'll do that in a follow-up content piece along with tomorrow's content piece for the next day, which will be the i5 review from Coffee Lake. Today, we're focusing on the 8700K. These tests will be a mixture of legacy tests from our test suite. So we've got a couple old ones that we're slowly phasing out, and we have new tests coming in. The reason we have both is because we ran them both in parallel, so 8700K went through the old tests and then the new tests, and that's because the new tests don't have 10 years worth of CPUs on them in terms of, I mean, over the past year, we've tested CPUs going back 10 years, uh, and so those are not present on the new benchmarks, but they are on the old ones, so we ran both in parallel, that way you get a sense for scaling. So uh, we're going to pop up the timestamps for this video, the table of contents, whatever you want to call it. And that's because this is densely packed. And all the disclaimers aside now, it will have thermals and delitting, overclocking, Blender, Premiere, gaming, all that stuff. And you can jump around if you want to, though. We'd obviously encourage you to watch all of it because it all comes together in the end and paints a pretty clear picture of how this CPU performs, but it is dense in terms of charts. And we'll have all of those in the article linked in the description below if you want it all on one page for easier reference in the future. We'll start this one with thermals and delitting since that's been a popular topic for us lately. We're running these tests with fixed frequencies and voltages as that's the only way to properly control for fluctuations in CPU behavior. We used Rocket Cool's DLID kit to remove the IHS, which we'll link below. This proved trivial to use and worked flawlessly, which for a $40 kit is pretty damn good. We can recommend this one for coffee like D-Lids. The previous model for KB Lake also works here. And D-Lidding the 8700K is easier than the Skylake X CPUs as it lacks the dual substrate layout. D-Lidding the CPU was matched with removing the silicone adhesive from only the IHS. We left it on the substrate for now. And then we applied Thermal Grizzly Conducto Knot Liquid Metal. 
We'll link that in the description as well if you're interested in it. And you can check some of our previous DLID content for more information on performance with Skylake X. Let's start with the more exaggerated results. When testing Blender with a 4.9 GHz frequency and 1.4 core voltage, our 8700K with Intel TIM and an NZXTX62 landed at 76 degrees Celsius average core temperature with a 10 second peak of 76.6C and a liquid temperature of 40.65C. The liquid metal version at the same frequency and voltage measured at 52.59 degrees Celsius. That's a reduction in average core temperature of nearly 24C. Liquid temperature measured about the same as before at 39.82C. Looking into this further, we realized that measured at the current clamp on the EPS 12 volt rails, the 8700K with Tim was drawing about 10 to 20 watts more power at the same voltage and frequency. We're not yet positive, but our present theory is that this outcome is a result of reduced power leakage on the CPU as a result of energy transfer efficiency improvement from the die to the IHS by way of using the conduct and not liquid metal, which is about 73 watts per meter Kelvin thermal conductivity versus something like three. So that would explain part of the power leakage reduction. Testing with Prime 95 28.5 and the CPU locked to 4.7 gigahertz core, 1.35 V core, we found the delta much closer than in the earlier overvolted tests. The TIM test plants us at 62.6 degrees Celsius average core temperature with a 10 second high at 63.82. Liquid temperature is effectively matched to the liquid metal version at 39.6 versus 39.8 C, and that's within our test error and resolution, so we can just call them effectively equal. Using Conductonaut, we're at 52.59 C for a 10 degree reduction in average core temperature, which is a pretty reasonable gain, though the previous gain was much more impressive. This isn't as big of a deal as with the Skylake X CPUs, when we were constrained by thermal limits with overclocking. The Coffee Lake CPUs run much cooler. We think, and I've consulted with some folks about this, we think that there's potentially better TIM on the Coffee Lake CPUs, which would coincide with some hints that Intel's given, but we have no way to really properly validate that. We can't scrape and test the thermal conductivity of the TIM. It's just not feasible for us. So that said, Coffee Lake actually does run reasonably cool all things considered. It starts getting a little warm once you're at 4.9 gigahertz and 1.4 volts, but up until that point, it's really not bad. But uh, the thermal scaling at the higher voltages and frequencies does ramp pretty aggressively. It's not a linear increase. So keep that in mind. A 10 to 20 degree reduction though is no small feat and does mean you can potentially reduce the RPM on your coolers, lower noise, things like that. And it's good for anyone pushing higher overclocks as well where you're gonna run into potential thermal limits with the lower end or smaller coolers. So uh, for the kits we used, I I'm gonna go ahead and give a shout again to Rocket Cool because they sent us that kit a while ago for KB Lake. We finally used it and it worked well. So if you're interested, check them out. Uh, Conductonaut has worked well for us also. And then if this stuff is scary to you, gonna give a quick shout to siliconlottery.com because I've heard they're going to have bin to CPUs within one to two weeks of launch. And uh, we worked with them previously on a KB Lake CPU. So those services are all options. If you want to either delid yourself, delid yourself, probably don't do that. But if you want to delid the CPU yourself and apply liquid metal, it's a 10 to 20 degrees, pretty damn good. So consider it whether it's DIY or not, but it's definitely not necessary. Unlike Skylake X, you will not be thermally constrained on the overclocks with Coffee Lake on a reasonably sized cooler as opposed to the 7960X where we were actually 200 megahertz higher by adding liquid metal. So that isn't as big a change as SkyX, but still a pretty good change. Next set of tests, we have two streaming and recording tests prior to the gaming workloads. For the first test, we're benchmarking live streaming capabilities as encoded on the CPU using OBS and X264 with the faster preset outputting to YouTube at 10 megabits per second, 1080p 60. The second test is done with local recording captured at 15 megabits per second, so internet's not an issue, and using X264 fast for the preset. So it is a better encoding option for higher quality. The second test is far more intensive versus the two and is more likely to stress the CPU into a point of dropping frames, 
even if somewhat of a synthetic test. We'll start with the easier workload, streaming Dirt Rally to YouTube at 10 megabits per second, and with the faster preset, we end up encoding 100% of the frames out of both the 8700K and the R7-1700 with effectively no dropped frames on either. We didn't overclock either because it just wasn't necessary. We are at or below 0.1% drop frames on the R7-1700, but that's within test variance and margin, so effectively zero. At this quality setting, the two produced the same viewer experience for the stream. The 7700K dropped 44% of its frames prior to the process prioritization tweak that we did, with the overclocked variance dropping about 30% of its frames. Manually assigning process priority allowed the 7700K to deliver 100% of its frames, dropping zero, but did require manual tuning and had another hit to performance that we'll see in a moment. The 8700K, the Coffee Lake CPU, and the R7-1700 both avoid this prioritization requirement for this particular test and do perfectly fine at delivering the full experience to the viewer. So they both pass this one. The next side of the coin is player experience, shown in FPS. The 8700K delivers a baseline performance of 136 FPS average with no streamed output, with 1% frame times measured at 109 or 98 FPS for 0.1% lows. Streaming drops us down to 122 FPS average, really not a bad drop, with 1% lows at 87, which is also not bad. 0.1% lows, however, have fallen down to 37 FPS, which seems a trend for all of our streamed outputs thus far. The R7 1700 places at 108 FPS average baseline with its streaming output at 91 or 65 FPS for the 1% lows and 37 for 0.1% lows. This comes down to threads versus frequency as an argument. Ryzen has more threads at a lower frequency, and the game wants frequency, but the stream wants threads. It's able to keep up with both reasonably, but has a hit to game performance versus the Intel alternative 8700K. But again, it's got the extra couple threads, so give and take as needed. But that's the last generation. The 8700K adds two more cores and four more threads while keeping a similar frequency. This significantly improves on the 7700K's former position and manages to keep up with the 1700 at these settings when streaming with a faster frame rate when gaming. This is more of a worst case scenario, meant to stress CPUs to a point of showing differences. We're recording locally at 15 megabits per second and using the fast preset done for both Dirt and Dota 2. With Dirt, we deliver 54.6% of frames to the recording, dropping 45.4%. The R7-1700, however, manages to deliver 57.8% of its frames, dropping 42.2%. Extra threads are helping in the encoding process here and manage to push the R7-1700 stock CPU into lead over the 8700K stock CPU. Where the R7 outperforms by a few percentage points in delivered frames to the stream, it does technically deliver them with more variable latency. The 8700K delivers its 54.6% of frames with 90.8% of them averaging the desired 16.667 milliseconds. So that would be your 60 FPS refresh. Roughly 4.6% of these are above the 16.7 millisecond range and about 4.6 below that range. The R7-1700 CPU delivers its percentage of frames, 57.8, so higher, with 75.6% of those frames averaging 16.7 milliseconds. Just under 11% are faster than 16.7, and just under 14% are slower than 16.7 milliseconds. As for FPS, the 8700K averages 136 FPS baseline without any capture interference, and the R7 averages 108 FPS average baseline. Neither CPU drops very far in its captured performance. We fall to 126 FPS average on the 8700K and 92 FPS average on the R7-1700, which amount to a 7.4% reduction and 14.8% reduction from baseline, respectively. Both CPUs have room in player-side FPS to improve capture-side delivery. There's not much point in spending all of those CPU resources on FPS for the player, to get above 100 FPS when considering that the recording just can't keep up. The 8700K has more room to play with in this particular title in this manner and has greater consistency despite a slight deficit in total frame delivery. With Dota 2 under the same conditions, the story changes a bit. The R7-1700 captures 85% of its frames successfully, dropping 14.9% in this torture workload. The i7-8700K 
captures 68% of its frames successfully. Playing these files back side by side, the result is obvious. In this particular title, the R7-1700 does provide a better capture output than the 8700K, though neither is ideal for our torture workload. You'd want to drop settings a little bit on the 1700 to recoup those 15% of dropped frames, but you'd have to drop significantly on the 8700K or start tuning with priorities. Here's a look at the frame rate chart. This gives a better idea as to where the 8700K's power is going. Baseline performance is 158 FPS average for the 8700K or 80 FPS for 1% lows. This is significantly bolstered over the 110 FPS average and 56 FPS 1% lows of the R7-1700, which is already known to drag a bit in Dota 2. Beginning the game capture, the 8700K drops 36% of its frame throughput to 101 FPS average, with the 1700 dropping a similar 35% of its frame throughput, but delivers more of its frames to the stream or the recording capture. Where the 8700K significantly outperforms the R7-1700 in player side frame rate, it is significantly underperforming in capture frame rate for this particular title. Giving process priority to OBS would solve this problem largely, as would an overclock, but that's exiting out of box territory. And just because these sort of synthetic torture workloads make it so that people often lose sight of the original real world scenario, both of these CPUs are perfectly fine for streaming and capture at 1080p 60 to YouTube at 10 megabits per second. You could even go a bit higher than that, uh, especially if you start tuning the X264 preset and you're really not gonna have to do much with priorities unless you're trying to do something like a fast or a medium preset, then you might need to give OBS process priority. Let's move on to power testing. We'll have more power tests in the article linked below, but we can start with just a few for now. Starting with Blender, the i7-8700K pulls about 96 watts down the EPS 12 volt cables. This is not power draw from the wall, it's measured with the current clamp. This is the stock configuration and permits the CPU to complete the render in 26.6 minutes. The R7-1700 pulls about 80 watts in this configuration, completing the render in around 29 minutes. More on that later. Overclocking the 8700K puts us up to 130 watts when at 4.9 gigahertz and 1.4 volts on our magically awful chip. This is right around where our overclocked R7-1700 lands for power. The i7-7700K stock CPU measures 74 watts for this test, marking it about 20 watts lower than the 8700K. A lot of this has to do with motherboard and BIOS as well, as always, so these numbers would change based on which board you're using and how much voltage it pushes. For the Firestrike physics test, the 8700K plots at 68 watts under its stock configuration, or 106 overclocked. For comparison, the 1700 draws about 55 watts stock, 95 overclocked, and the 7700K sits around 50 watts with our Gaming 7 motherboard and the latest EFI. This is the important part for the gaming tests going forward. So for these, we're starting with our legacy benchmarks first. These are conducted completely differently from the rest of the game tests that we're using moving forward and will stand as a long-term support option that allows you to compare against a lot of CPUs, but it's being phased out because it's becoming less accurate with time. That's because the legacy tests that we have done for the past year now are now outdated in a few ways. Video card drivers, Windows version, and graphics card. We're starting to bump into GPU limits in some games. Going forward, we're using a 1080 Ti FTW3 for the GPU rather than a 1080 FTW1, non-TI, and we've updated our memory time and timings, we've updated our Windows version, we've updated our graphics drivers. So the tests are not comparable between them, just to make that clear. Starting with two legacy charts, in Battlefield 1, the 8700K chart tops at 151 FPS average, placing it a few percent ahead of the 7700K. As for scalability, it goes like this. The Intel i7-930 Nehalem CPU runs at 96 FPS average and is about 10 years old, with the overclocked variant at 118 FPS average. The i7-2600K runs at 118 FPS average, with the 4.7 GHz version performing at 132 FPS average. That's roughly a 23% climb in stock-to-stock -stock performance. We skip Ivy Bridge here and jump to Devil's Canyon 4790K for the i7, operating at 140 FPS average. The i7-6700K is at 141 FPS average, and the 7700K is at 146 FPS average. Part of the reason for our new tests is this one. We're bumping into other limits here, clearly, so we'll soon be moving on to the new GPU and new games. 
In our Legacy Watch Dogs 2 test, the 8700K performed nearly the same as the 7700K, held back in some ways by the more limited boost clock. We noticed that our Gigabyte board often only turbos to 4.4 GHz on the Z370 board for all core turbo during gaming scenarios. This is 100 MHz lower than the 7700K's all core turbo and is sometimes reflected in games by a slight frame deficit. That said, this is a legacy test and we'll see if that changes for the new one. Despite the increased core count, Intel here is facing a similar scenario to AMD with Ryzen. They have heavily multi-threaded capable CPUs, but they're facing adoption challenges on the gaming front. In the future, now that both vendors are pushing for higher thread counts, it'll happen. But for games out today, some will benefit from threads and some would better benefit from speed. We've been told that some of the ASUS boards boost to 4.7 GHz all core and stock settings, which would net a higher FPS. Let's move on to the new game tests, which use all the new testing methodology that we've kind of already pointed out, but is also in the article link in the description below, along with extra charts for games that won't be shown here. Starting with Civilization VI, we used the AI benchmark to test a different metric, time required to compute AI turns, as FPS is rather useless here. The turn time is about the same at 1440p as it is at 1080p, though we did test both. Average FPS actually goes up for worse CPUs because the time spent idling on the screen is longer. So just to reiterate that and make sure it gets through, the reason we're not using FPS as a metric for the AI benchmark is because as you plot it with worse and worse CPUs, FPS goes up. Why does that happen? It happens because in an AI benchmark where you're testing turn time, a longer turn means more time spent staring at the same non-moving elements on the screen, whereas a faster CPU is going to jump around to points on the map a lot more frequently and will fit in the timed benchmark more. So that means the FPS will be worse on those. Hence, we're not including FPS benchmarks because there's no point. Civ's not really a game where you do that. So back to the times then. The 5 gigahertz overclocked i7-8700K holds the fastest average turn time at about 15.4 to 15.5 seconds per turn. To give an idea for range, this is a 26.6% reduction from the slowest time. Although a five second average turn time is not huge, keep in mind that this is per turn. So a five player game would benefit from a 25 second reduction in total time per total turn to get to your next turn. Across lawn play periods, this can add up, but the relevance of it is really up to you. Anyway, the 8700K stock CPU completes its turns in about 16.1 seconds, or about 4% slower than the overclock. The 7700K stock CPU completes its turns in 16.5 seconds, with the 4.1 GHz 1600X not far behind. As you can tell by looking at the 1600X stock and OC numbers, the 1700 stock and OC numbers, and the 8700K stock and OC numbers, frequency matters in this game to a point that's perhaps greater than threads. The 7700K versus 8700K also indicates that frequency is of at least slightly more importance than the thread count. For Total War's new benchmark, we measured the 8700K as a chart topper at 1080p with 176 FPS average and lows at 110 and 95 FPS. We experienced a bottleneck at 1080p with the overclock not providing any additional performance versus stock, so we're stuck at the GPU here. The 7700K is 7.4% slower at 163 FPS average with the R5 1600X at 4.1 GHz running a 147 FPS average and is 16% slower than the 8700K. Total War favors the frequency advantage of the 1600X over the stock 1700 clearly. At 1440p, we equalize some of the distance with GPU limitations, but still see differences. The i7 8700K is clearly still bottlenecked on the GPU, operating a now reduced 153 FPS average for each SKU. The 7700K runs at 143 or 7% behind, and the stock R7 1600X runs 20% behind the 8700K as shown here. Project Cars at 1080p has the 5 GHz 8700K at 127 FPS average, benefiting from the frequency focus of the game. The 4.4 GHz all-core operating frequency condemns the 8700K to perform about the same as the 4.5 GHz 7700K in our testing, both at around 108 to 110 FPS average. The R7 1700 further demonstrates the frequency focus of this game, placing at 78.5 FPS stock, but 87 FPS at 4 GHz. The result is a staggering 45% difference for the 5GHz 8700K versus the 4GHz 1700, 
or 43% versus the 4.1 gigahertz 1600X. Stock to stock, the difference shrinks to 27% versus the higher clocked 1600X. At 1440p, the 8700K manages 118 FPS average overclocked, 106 FPS stock, and with our all core 100 megahertz deficit to the 7700K producing the expected favor for KB Lake. Ryzen performance remains more or less exactly where it was for the 1080p results as a result of being CPU bottlenecked. We have a few more game benchmarks in the article linked below. If you want GTA 5 and some others, it'll be there, but this video is getting pretty long at this point, so we'll leave them to the article. Getting into some production workloads now, we'll start with our legacy Blender test using 2.78a, then move to the updated renders on 2.79. Like the gaming section, we're doing this to give an idea for scaling against a year's worth of CPUs, but also to provide important modernized information with a more limited data set. With version 2.78a and our in-house monkey heads render, the 8700K stock CPU takes 23.7 minutes to complete the render, which is about a 44% time reduction from the 7700K stock CPU's 42 minute render time. Compared to R7 CPUs, the 8700K takes about 11 to 13% less time to render than the 3.9 gigahertz overclocked R7 CPUs, including the 1700X at 3.9 GHz and 3466 MHz memory speed. The 8700K takes 28% less time to render than the R7 1700, and that's thanks to its high frequency and core count combination for the performance. Turns out Intel also has version 2.78A to thank. For version 2.79, we're using the test shown on the screen now. The monkey head render takes 26.6 minutes to render on the 8700K, compared to 28.8 minutes on the 1700, both with 3200 MHz CL16 memory. The 8700K completes the monkey head render 7.6% faster than the R7 1700, and that closes the gap in this case. Overclocking both produces a 24.15 minute render on the 8700K, or 24.7 minutes on the 1700. For Adobe Premiere and other benchmarks not shown here, check the article linked in the description below. Uh, I'm gonna leave it there. You've got enough data to really piece together your own conclusion at this point. I don't need to spend five more minutes talking about it. The only commentary I have to offer right now is pricing and availability. We know what the MSRP is. We don't know what it's going to cost when it launches because we filmed this before it's available on retail. So if the price is MSRP, the 8700K definitely has a place in the environment for the right users. Apparently there are power delivery optimizations on Z370. It would still be nice to see the CPU work on Z270, but it might not be that simple. And Intel, frankly, won't tell us anything further than what we already know. As for Z390, that is supposed to carry performance improvements. Z370 is somewhat of a stopgap between now and Z390. And Intel clearly moved this launch a little bit forward to better compete because they just launched KB Lake on the 7700K in January. So if you already own something like a 7700K, unless you have a very specific reason for this 8700K, I'd say don't upgrade. But for older CPUs, obviously there are reasons to upgrade to either Ryzen or Intel at this point. You've got a whole list of data, pick through it, find your use case and decide from there because it's very use case dependent at this point. I'm not going to put a blanket statement on if you should buy it or not. Availability in some regions will allegedly be low, but we're just not sure yet. Those are still rumors. So if it's low, I'm sure I'll be complaining about it in an episode soon enough. So subscribe for that if it happens. Otherwise, the i5 review comes shortly. This was enough for now. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus. If you'd like to help us out directly, if you've never seen us before, this is what we do. So help us out if you like it. I'll see you all next time.